next, and I will apologize uh, to Dr. Yampolsky because I probably didn't say his name correctly, um, but I believe he is with us via Zoom. Um, Dr. Yampolsky is an independent AI safety researcher. Um, I, before this meeting, a video and PowerPoint was sent out to all the members, and um, Dr. Yampolsky is going to provide additional insights to any questions we may have. Um, having watched that, uh, find him, find his research and what he does uh, extremely fascinating. And so with that, uh, Dr. Yampolsky, you're uh, free to, if, if you don't care to introduce yourself, and then you can begin your testimony. Thank you so much for inviting me to share some knowledge. I am Dr. Roman Yampolsky. I do research on AI safety. Today I'm speaking as a Kentucky and I'm not representing any organization, my employer. I think this issue is completely bipartisan. And I will start by answering four questions I was uh, given by the organizers and then open it up to Q&A on anything you might be interested in. So first about my background, I've been doing work on AI safety and security for well over a decade. I saw uh, progress in AI, which is truly exponential. Those concerns went from, this is just science fiction, the fighting Terminators, to this is incredibly real. This morning, I saw Nobel Prize in Physics awarded to a computer scientist for artificial intelligence research. A computer scientist who is at the forefront of uh, being an AI safety advocate. So this is definitely not science fiction anymore. We are probably just a few years away from getting AI to perform as well as a person on most tasks, most domains. I think it's already true in many domains, not in all, but in quite a few. And soon after we get to this human level, artificial general intelligence, we're likely to exceed those capabilities. We're likely to get systems which are better than all people in all domains, including science and engineering. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of progress in safety, in control, in our ability to predict what those systems will do, how will they solve problems we give them. So in terms of my advice for legislation, and I'm not uh, an expert in that part of the process, I would uh, suggest looking at a very successful initiative in terms of uh, legislating advanced systems, specifically systems I'm worried about out of California. They had a law which concentrated on safe and secure innovation for frontier AI models. And it was uh, overwhelmingly supported by legislation, had very high levels of support uh, from citizens of California, but was vetoed by the governor, mostly because of commercial pressures from large labs in the state. I think Kentucky can become a leader in AI safety uh, by actually passing a similar type of legislation, which would concentrate on making advanced AI systems, which they defined as requiring over $100 million to train safe and secure. Uh, we will likely not face similar uh, pressures not to pass that legislation since fewer advanced AI labs are uh, residents of our state, and we can be leaders in uh, safety. In general, I think all the benefits of AI, and I'm a researcher of AI, I'm a huge fan of technology, all the benefits of it can be obtained from AI, which is specialized for specific problems. Those are tools we can solve diseases, we can improve energy consumption, we can solve scientific problems without having to create general systems, general superintelligence, systems which would compete with us, system which would make us really unnecessary. So with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions you might have about state of AI or what we can and should be doing about it. Senator Thomas. Is it Yampolsky? Am I pronouncing your last name correctly? It's beautiful. You got it. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Yampolsky, I'm going to tell you, you, you were the impetus uh, and, and getting me to talk to my caucus uh, and to some other legislators about 
of the fact that we needed to really delve into AI. Um, uh, and, uh, and along with uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Chairwoman uh, Bledsoe, uh, I filed some AI bills last year as well, or this year as well. Uh, you know, because of your talk, uh, I want to begin by the, by the last thing you said. I mean, give me a scenario, please, because uh, obviously this is critically important to all of us. Give me a scenario, a scenario, and I don't want to be science fiction, in which you, in which you can say that if, if, if we are not smart about this, and I do mean, I mean, AI is here to stay, but I want to be smart about how we use it and, and how we regulate it. That 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 the system could be smarter than us, and we be, we will become irrelevant. I mean, that's when you say that, that's a very frightening thought. So, give us a scenario in which that might occur. I mean, help me envision what that looks like. Sure. So, there's quite a few different ways to get to that. Uh, the more pleasant ones involve uh, technological unemployment. Basically, we develop systems capable of doing all jobs, not just some jobs, automatically better cheaper and so there is no particular reason to hire most people there still could be a niche market for man-made products or services but majority of people will lose their jobs so you have unemployment at scales we haven't seen before not 10 20 30 percent but almost universal technological unemployment so that's kind of a good outcome where we're all still around and enjoying life. And maybe if we do it right, we have unconditional basic income. We tax the companies, we tax the robots. And so there is some redistribution with, of this uh, windfall in terms of free labor, both physical and cognitive. Thank you, Senator Thomas. Uh, Representative Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Yampolsky, I, I really do appreciate uh, you testifying here today. I, I did watch your testif uh, testimony before in Chairman Pratt's committee and, and uh, found it very interesting. It seems to me, and, and Chairman, if you, you'll indulge me, I have a comment and then a question. Uh, it seems to me in all the policy classes that we've, we've that I've attended, We've give, been given a 10,000-foot view of what is AI, what can it do, what can it possibly do in the future. And it, it's kind of a challenge to us. I'll speak for myself, but in some of my conversations with other colleagues, it's it's hard to really nail down what we need to put in statute. And so for me, in, in chairing administrative regulations, it seems to me that we could really benefit from having regulatory frameworks in place to be able to tackle this technology when it comes to the forefront. So... Um, I guess my question would be, what advice would you give to us as a legislative body as we begin to craft policy and maybe look towards regulating um, AI in the future? So I think you're doing a wonderful job with a lot of narrow issues. I'm not up to date on specifically what legislation has already been passed. I know from other states, California is one example that is excellent work on deep fakes on privacy and algorithmic bias. But I'm specifically concerned about existential risks from advanced AI. And there is no reason why we should create our own replacements. So I would strongly advocate for strong limits on super intelligence systems more capable than humans in all domains. And it's a very different uh, process for training systems with general knowledge, multimodal system versus systems for a specific problem. We have a lot of examples where a narrow problem, for example, protein folding, was solved by specifically targeting it. We had a narrow, super intelligent AI in that domain, and we got huge benefit out of solving this problem. I think until we have made significant progress in safety, creation of a general super intelligence will not benefit humanity. And I'm actually questioning our ability to ever be able to indefinitely control superintelligent systems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Co-Chair Bledsoe. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question. I'm going to follow up because that is exactly one of the concerns that I, when I talk to others about existential risk and long-term, it is about, is this something you can control? And for most of my conversations with people, it's, yes, we'd like to, but is that actually potentially 
is, is it feasible, I think is, is concerning. So would you speak a little bit to, I know you, you did in your presentation some, for those that are listening, you know, what does control look like and is that even feasible for us to try to regulate? In my research, I found that there are strong limits to what we can do with very advanced AI in terms of understanding how it works, in terms of predicting what it's going to do, in terms of verifying its future decisions, in terms of keeping it uh, in a state we would like it to be in terms of safety, not self-improving, modifying, learning new capabilities from malevolent actors, from faulty data, and so I think it's actually not possible to indefinitely control those systems. I think it's sort of like a perpetual safety machine by analogy with perpetual motion machine. We're not just trying to make GPT-5 or 6 or 7 safe, but we'll always have to make sure every AI system, every modification in any environment with all actors remains perfectly safe. And even a single bug could be the last one. So I would basically say don't permit development of systems of that capability unless there is scientific consensus that we have solved safety issues. Thank you for that. And I think that's very similar to what we've we've discussed. There is no, we will you put regulations in place, you put legislation in place, and yet we're going to be continuously evaluating every year as different as, as it changes rapidly, how best to, to protect the people in the Commonwealth. And I appreciate your thoughts there as, as well. And I think that on the predictability and what it does, it's kind of like once you get to that point, you do lose. Um, it, it's hard to put a genie back in the bottle, as they say. And I appreciate well, your thoughts and, and warnings. One on year is a very long time in AI safety research. Very long time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Senator Williams. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm really, the end of this question is transparency of these systems, but the beginning is, do you have any concerns or what's the impact of open AI and this general research moving from public domain, sort of open source into the private sector where it's closed and uh, perhaps proprietary um, structures or uh, that we don't really, nobody can know what they are. Uh, is is that going to have an impact in the short run and the long run? Where do you see transparency in terms of the code uh, fitting into the AI of the future? I'm very concerned. OpenAI was founded as a nonprofit to benefit all of humanity with advanced technology. Now it's shifting towards the exact opposite. It's a closed AI, and it's for benefit of people who invest billions in this technology, people who are running this company, and they're not accountable in any way. They are completely in charge of what they're doing, what products they're releasing. There is not a government agency directly supervising any of it, providing approvals for any of that. If tomorrow they have a breakthrough and do get to AGI or super intelligence, uh, game over. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question myself. Um, one of the things we've not discussed is energy policy and how that interacts with artificial intelligence. Um, you know, we see these huge data centers kind of popping up all across the country, but they're only able to locate in certain places because, you know, energy is pretty scarce and it takes a lot of power to, to run these facilities. Um, is that a bottleneck within the the AI space? And do you have any thoughts or opinion on energy policy and how that interacts with artificial intelligence? I'm a lot less knowledgeable about energy, but yes, it is a bottleneck. They are trying to create new sources, new nuclear power plants. I think another big bottleneck is the infrastructure. We don't have infrastructure capable of supporting this amount of energy being transferred being utilized properly. Some of it is pretty old or damaged in natural disasters. So there is a lot of need for creating new energy sources, new energy uh, grid to, to support what uh, will be 10x, 100x increase in demand if the training runs we see right now scale as we are predicting. We are looking at 100 billion compute cluster 
as the next level AI systems are developed. Okay, and then just kind of for my own information here, as far as timeline towards um, artificial general intelligence, do you have, what's your gut say on that? I mean, is this something, it wouldn't surprise you if this is announced this week or if it's two years from now, or what, what's your gut feeling on that? If, uh, let's say 20 years ago, somebody described what a modern large language model can do today to a set of computer scientists, they would all say we already have it. We have general intelligence. It speaks every language, it pl plays every musical instrument, it can help you with physics, chemistry, any science you want. If you look at what uh, leaders of those labs are saying, and they might be biased, they're trying to raise funds, they are saying we're two, three years away from AGI. If you look at prediction markets, the best tool we have for predicting future, they are fluctuating, but also three, four years is exactly where most people think it is. Okay. Are there any other questions? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, listen, that's why we wanted to have Dr. Yampolsky on is because, um, you know, he, he's based out of Kentucky. He's obviously very well researched in this, has spent more time than any of us could ever dive into it. And, um, it, it really respect his opinion. Um, Senator Williams. Uh, just one final question. Perhaps it's a moving target. Is all this research into artificial intelligence actually uh, advancing our knowledge or understanding of what I'll call actual intelligence or human intelligence? I mean, because it's maybe our understanding is a moving target on that. Is what we used to think was intelligence is just rote memorization. So is our understanding of what employs human intelligence also maturing? I think so. There is a lot of uh, information exchange between neuroscience and AI. Machine learning is inspired by neuroscience, and now neuroscience is learning from what we are doing with those devices in terms of understanding how collections of neurons represent information, make decisions. A lot of mistakes those systems make are very similar to the mistakes humans make, because both are neural networks. One is Natural one is artificial, but they are based on the same set of principles. So we're starting to see a lot of similarities. And yes, what people used to say about human mind being very magical in certain ways now is being automated and it kind of takes out some of that magic. Not all of it yet. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Yampolsky. I really appreciate your testimony. Um, I will not be able to sleep very well tonight. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. If I can help with anything, always. Yeah, I will be in touch. Um, 